today, part two of Stop Going to Church, we're looking at not just doing church, but being church by growing, by growing. And uh, I've discovered that as human beings, we're pretty complex kind of creatures, aren't we? And, uh, and I've discovered that it's easy as a human being that we can, we can really grow and thrive in one area, but be completely stunted in another area. Who's with me? You can grow and be strong. See, it's like this. You can, you can be physically fit. This is a little selfie I took on the beach this week. Shave the mo. You can be physically fit, but hopeless with money. You can be really good at your job, absolutely the, the top at your, in your workplace, but completely hopeless at marriage. Can't you? See, we can have an incredible ministry, ministry to thousands and touch lives, but we can also be overweight, obese and unhealthy, can't we? This was not a selfie I took during the week. So we can grow in one area, but we can be stunted in another area. But God is interested in the whole of our lives that we grow. And Paul said in the word that the most important area that we grow is in our spiritual life in our spiritual walk with God. 1 Timothy 4, 8, it says, For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. I was chatting with, uh, was it Jess? Jess? Yeah, earlier. How so easy. Uh, you know, we kind of get, get slave, enslaved to the urgent, the next thing that has to be done today. And yet those really important things, like, getting to know God more, discovering our purpose and destiny. The big questions of life and eternity often fall to the back burner. And yet this is the very area. Paul says, hey, physical training's all good. And I've been, I've actually activated my little, uh, little uh, Apple activity thing. It tells me when to stand up and actually stops me every now and again and buzzes my wrist and tells me when to breathe. Who knows you're in trouble when your exercise app is just telling you to breathe. It's like, I thought I was breathing. Uh, it's good to grow physically and be physically fit in these things. But Paul says even better than that is godliness, is learning about God, growing in Him, growing our walk with God. How's your walk with God going? How's your word life? How's your, your prayer life at the moment? Are you feeling strong? Are you encouraged? Is God speaking to you? Or is it kind of waning a little bit? Is it kind of falling to the, to the side a little bit? See a couple of nods. It's okay. You came on, the, on a good day. See, the Christian life, it's always meant to be progressing, moving forward, growing and expanding. Philippians 3.14, Paul says, I press on. You want to say press on. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I press on. To hear the passion in God in Paul's voice, he says, I, I press on. I'm, I'm, I'm finished with yesterday. I'm not going to hold on. I'm not going to settle down. See, I think the problem with many of us is we just sort of settle down. Our culture loves comfort, entertainment. It's easy. This, our culture is designed for us just to sit back and settle down and, you know, laissez-faire, let this life just glide on by. And it will if we don't grab a hold of it. And if we're serious about God's purpose for our life, that we need to press on. We need to lay hold. We need to begin to take our spiritual growth seriously. It's my first Big thought this morning is that where there is life, there is growth. Do you agree? Where there is life, there is growth. We're talking about growing, uh, growing in God, and it's where there is life, there is growth. It's true of my kids. We, we just kind of keep feeding them. You know, we just, my goal is just keep them alive. I think I've shared that before. If they even just left with me, uh, I just as long as they're alive at the other end, when Emma comes back, it's a win. We just got to keep our kids. We just keep feeding them, and they just grow. It just happens. And in fact, if they didn't grow, something would be wrong, wouldn't it? Something would be seriously wrong if we were taking care of our kids and they weren't growing. Because where there's life, there's health. Just look at your lawn. It's springing up at the moment as you enter into spring. Where there's life, there is growth and this is true of us in our spiritual life it's true in church where there's life in church and may we always be a church that's alive to the presence of god that's alive in the things of god because where there is life there is 
growth. We're going to grow in Him. Colossians 2.19. Paul talks about uh, some people who stopped growing. Some people who got stunted. So many people in church, just going to church, end up stunted in their spiritual life and not progressing on to the things that God has for them. There's hope for you. But he speaks to these people or about these people in Colossians 2.19. He says this. Listen really carefully. He says, they have lost connection with the head. They have lost connection from the head from which the whole body is supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews and grows as God causes it to grow. So we've got a picture of the church. Christ as the head. The head has the brain in it. He's got the plan. He's the man with the master plan. Amen? For our lives, for our church. Christ is the head. And he is all wise. And and we're his body. We've got to be connected to him. And this is the thing. This is my next big point. Is that life comes through connection. Everyone say life. Life. Comes through connection. connection. See, because where there's there's life, there's growth. And life comes through connection. Connection with God, the head. We need to be connected with him in prayer and worship and the word. And we need to be connected with one another, with other believers, with the church. This is the soil in which we can grow. Where there's life, there's growth. And life comes through connection. Didn't Jesus say in John 15, he said, I am the vine and you are the Yeah. As he said, I'm the trunk of the tree, you're the branch. If you cut that branch off, how long is it going to live for? Not long. But he said, man, when you're connected with me, all that life-giving grace, that life-giving spirit that I pour into your life, he says, the fruit just happens. Good fruit happens in your life. See, some of us are going around trying so hard like an apple tree, trying to strive our apples. Have you ever seen a cow struggle to moo? <laughs> no, it just moves. Because that's how God made it. And when we're connected to God, fruit just happens. Instead of trying to be more patient, trying to be more loving, trying to be more this, and, and that's worthy, and that's good. But some of you, it becomes a religious thing, a striving thing. But guess what? We get to relax when we're connected with Jesus, when we're spending time in his presence, when we're reading his word, change begins to happen on the inside. Can someone testify to that? Change just happens. He produces change in us. How? Through connection with him. He's the vine, we're the branches. And secondly, through connection with other believers, the body of Christ. Now tell me, if I chop my finger off, would it have a life apart from my body? We never believe what my fingers up to these days. It's got its own Facebook account and uh, doing all kinds of wonderful things in this world. No, it's going to die, wither away, and put in a bin, bury. I don't know, because it has no life unless it's connected to my body. It has no purpose. It has no function unless it's connected to my body. The Bible says that we are one body. Christ is the head. We are His body. We're connected to Him, but we're also connected to one another. That'd be wonderful. Bully for you if you're a finger in the body. But I'm a finger. (laughs) Really, I'm an ear. (laughs) You know. Are you connected? Because the whole point, my finger's useless to me unless it's connected to the rest of my body so I can pick stuff up. I can pick my nose, pick other things. I can pick stuff with my finger. And the ear has no purpose except that it's attached to my body. It's connected. We need to be connected to one another so we can hear the voice. Some are great at hearing God. Some are great at seeing, having visions in God and, and, and seeing the future of where the church needs to go. Some are, are heart people. They've got huge compassion. And I just take my hat off at these people. Just incredible compassion and mercy gifts and get alongside others incredibly. Some are, for, are, are made to be up front. Some serve quietly behind the scenes. We're all made differently. We're going to look more of that next week. But growing means we've got to be connected to God, connected with one another because life comes through connection. Amen? And when it comes to spiritual growth, of course, our goal is to be like Him. Yeah? Like Jesus. Like Him. Isn't He amazing? Isn't He incredible? 
You know, I hate it. You know, we look at our media caricatures as Christ, as all kinds of some wimpy kind. He was the most beautiful, powerful, incredible person who ever lived. There's been no one more whole, more secure, more free, more bold, more full of joy to the point where even little kids wanted to be near him. And stodgy religious people, everyone in society just wanted to be near Jesus. They could, the crowds would press in around him because, not because he was some great charismatic leader, but because of who he was as a person. He is Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the leader of his church, amen, and the leader of our lives. He is worthy of us following. And it's him that we want to become more like in humility and love and faith, and wisdom, and joy, and all of these things. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory. 1 John 2 says, Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. This is our destiny, to live as He did. And He was the most secure, loving, joyful, free person ever. Tell me, have you ever seen a mature believer, or met a mature believer, and just thought, man... You know what? When I grow up, I want to be just like them. We sat down with John the other day. He had a good couple with him and chatted. And he's telling me stories about his life. I walked out of that meeting going, man, God, when I grow up, I want to be like John. I just want to be like that. Maybe like Jesus, like John on the way to being like Jesus. Can I put it like that? Mature believers are incredible. They have a faith that is strong. That can weather the storms. Whatever life throws at them, they stand strong and secure. Mature believers have big love, amen? Have a real passion, just heartfelt passion for God, love for God, and a genuine concern and care for other people. That's just out of this world. Mature believers uh, have, uh, what I, I love the old King James calls patience, long-suffering. I love that. See, because mature believers, well, they have long-suffering. They've endured seasons of life and, and gone through seasons that are tough and that are hard. And yet they've learned to be able to stand strong, to continually to be faithful, to keep doing the basics well, even in the hard seasons. This is what it means to grow up, to be a mature believer. Strong faith, big love, long suffering. God's got a little bit of work to do on me yet. Just when I'm in traffic, I'll tell you what. <laughs> so what does the Bible say about spiritual growth? How do we grow? Well, the first thing I want to say is that growth is not compulsory. It's not compulsory as people see. Have you ever witnessed a, a grown adult acting like a kid? Just ask my wife this week. Have you ever watched a grown adult acting like a child, immature in some area? It can happen, can't it? Because growth is not compulsory and spiritual growth growth in God is not compulsory it takes intention it takes choice it takes decision and most of all it takes hunger are you hungry to grow or are you just kind of like comfortable where you are oh, I'm all good thanks I'm oh, sweet as such kiwis aren't we or is there a fire burning on the inside this is God I'm not happy where I am God I know there's more God I know there's more of you I can have I want greater encounters with you God I want to see you move I want to see greater healings God I want to be like my wife and get names first and second names of children God I want to hear your voice God I want to be strong in faith that when the hard things come I can support and stand next to others and give them strength amen God, I want to grow spiritually. I want to grow in my love. I don't want to just like people who like me, who are like me. I want to love everybody. I want to be one who can love my enemies, those who come against me. Jesus said, love your enemies. Like, ouch. That's hard. Have you tried? Woo. Yeah, God, I love them. I love them so much. Because you love them so much and you died on the cross for them. Oh, I love them too. But as we're connected, we grow and our hearts grow and expand and God puts you through the ring and, and you come in the other side and your heart's a bit bigger and a bit more floppy and a bit kind of more able to kind of love and just, just kind of get on with stuff. I just want to fast forward and be mature. I want to get there. Is there a hunger on the inside of you to grow in the things of God? It's not compulsory. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, brothers and sisters, he's writing to a church in a place called Corinth. He says, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit. But as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ, I, get, I, gave you, I, I, I gave you milk, not solid food, 
Remember that? Baby food. I couldn't give you solid food. For you are not ready for it yet. Indeed, you still are not ready. What's he saying? He's saying growth's not compulsory. And you guys, you should have been grown up by now. You should be mature in your faith. You should be discipling others, helping others. You should be getting out there and making a difference, demonstrating the goodness of God in supernatural ways in your community. And still, you kind of go, meh, feed me. <laughs> meh, feed me. It's scary. Grown adults wanting to be fed. That's the primary reason people leave church. I didn't get fed there. How old are you? How long have you been in Christ? Feed yourself, amen? If you don't get anything out of this message today, go feed yourself. There's heaps online. There's podcasts. There's stuff. There's, there's great preachers. None as good as me, I confess. But they're out there. There are books. There are tapes. I've hooked into audio books like this. Fantastic. I don't have to read. I hate reading. But I can just listen to it. You get the Bible on audio. So many options. But growth is not compulsory. It takes a hunger. It takes a choice. Another thing the Bible says is that there's, there's clear levels. There's levels to our spiritual growth. I'm really excited. But turn to 1 John chapter 2. Turn to 1 John and chapter 2. And I'm going to put it up on screen for those who don't have their Bibles with them today. 1 John chapter 2. Now, this is actually a poem that the Apostle John, he wrote about spiritual growth. And because we, it was written in Greek, we kind of lose the, the poeticness of it. And it's a little bit wordy, but it's okay. All is going to become clear at the other end, all right? So just bear with me. I'm just going to read through this poem. But listen to it. John says, from verse 12, I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Amen? And in this poem, there are, there are three levels of spiritual growth that John talks about. Children, it says young men, but it's not a sexist thing. It's just how they wrote and gender in those days. So I'll just say young adults and fathers and mothers. Three clear states. And I love it. It's family because church is family. And in the family of God, it's not talking about biological age. This is referring to biological, you know, it's a parallel. But it's talking to those in Christ who are, who are children. You know, so you can be 81, still a child in Christ. Just come to Christ. So there are children in the faith. There are young adults in the faith. And then there are mothers and fathers in the faith. And he says specific things about each of these, each of these levels. First, it says about children. Maybe you're a spiritual child. Maybe you're still learning to, to understand the things of God and wrap your head around the things of God. And that's a great place to be. And I'm glad you're here this morning. Children, it says, it says their sins are forgiven and they have known the Father. Their sins are forgiven, and they have known the Father. See, the first step in our spiritual growth is that we acknowledge our own sin, that we've messed up, that we have not lived the intended God, the life that God made us to live. He is not, uh, we have not lived His way. We've done wrong things. We've done wrong, had wrong thoughts. We've, we've, we've treated people wrong. We've treated ourselves wrongly. This is the world we live in. We, have, we are broken, and we live in sin. And when we can acknowledge our own sin, not just pointing the finger at everybody else, which we're really good at. Not just go, well, he's worse than me, oh, I'm better than him, and we kind of compare. But when we do that, it's like a, a, like a tribe of pygmies, you know, arguing who's the tallest. We've all fallen short, the Bible says. We have all sinned. We've all broken God's command. We've all broken God's heart because we have not lived the way he designed us to live to love each other because we live in a broken world and we are broken. And when we acknowledge that and we receive Christ's forgiveness, we finally go, I don't have to carry guilt and shame. I don't have to make excuses. I don't have to point the finger. I don't have to defend myself. I can just come in humility. This is such a beautiful thing. Christianity is not a religion where you jump through hoops to try and make it up to God. That's the definition of religion. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with God. When we come to Him honestly, openly and say, God, forgive me. I haven't lived your way. We don't clean our lives up to come to church. We come to church to get our lives cleaned up. Can someone say amen? Yeah. And it's God that does the cleaning up, not us. Yeah. We just got to be honest and real and say, God, I have sin in my life. I've messed up. Come on, for me, it's still a daily thing. You're all so holy. <laughs> 
But this is what it means to be a spiritual child. First step, acknowledging our sins and receiving that forgiveness. I remember the day my dad came into my bedroom. I was 10 years old to tuck me in. And uh, he says, oh, have you ever given your heart to Jesus? I said, what is that? He said, never mind. Just follow me in this prayer. And so I followed him in a prayer. Jesus, I give you my life. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I put my faith in you. Amen. Amen. Right, okay. And he walked out of that room. I was left in the dark, meant to be going off to sleep. But something happened on the inside of me. I didn't even understand it here. But on the inside, I felt so clean. I felt so washed. I got out of my bed and started doing a little teach. I started jumping around my room. I had no idea what had happened to me. I didn't even know, I didn't even know to say thank you, Jesus. I felt so clean. I was only 10 years old, but I was already aware that I needed to be washed. And I felt so good. The, the problem is no one told me that the next time I, I make a mistake, that I can just come straight back to Christ and say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And I can remain in that place. Instead, the more I messed up, it just got worse. And I felt condemned. And I started to hide from God. And, and, and I fell away from the things of God until I was 15, where God radically saved me. But the first step, the first level is acknowledging our sins and receiving Christ. And also says they know the Father. Knowing the Father, this is where we get our identity from. How many of you know when we come to Christ, we receive a new identity in God? Amen. He gives us a new identity in Christ when we begin to learn and, and grow in who we are. Man, I'm not just a worthless, pathetic, you know, whatever, or what my mother said about me, or what that teacher said about me. I am who God says about me. I'm a loved, chosen, holy child of God. Amen. And I can be secure in that. Man, this is what it means to grow spiritually, to know our identity in Christ. The second level is young adults. Sorry, I got it up there. Children, forgiveness, new identity, young adult. This is another level John touches on and says about these ones that they are strong in the word. The word of God lives in them and they are overcoming the evil one. This growth step is about growing in the understanding of this book, of the supernatural word of God. This book is a miracle. This book isn't just words on a page or a history lesson. This book can change your life. And as we read it, as we feed on it, we begin to come closer to God and we get strengthened. Another step of maturity from being a child to become a young adult is learning to be able to feed yourself on the Word of God. Learn to nourish your spirit. Begin to grow in the things of God. I recommend pray reading the Word. Turn what you're reading into a prayer as you read it. And it says they're, over, they're overcoming the evil one. This is the place where we're gaining victory over the flesh and the world. This is what it means to be a young adult in Christ, where we, that struggle between who we were and who we are now in Christ, we're overcoming those things, and we're learning to become more like Christ and experience the freedom. Someone say freedom. Yeah. We're coming out of all that bondage and, and, and all those grave clothes and all those old habits and ways of thinking and the worldly influence. Our mind is being renewed on the Word of God, and we're going to step into that identity, not just knowing about the identity positionally but we're starting to experience it yeah. and we're starting to feel more peace in our lives we're starting to feel the freedom of christ the joy of god comes bubbling up it's an amazing thing when suddenly you know bad things happen the pressure's on and you just feel joy bubbling up it's like wow I remember the first time I had a car accident in Spaghetti Junction in Auckland and uh, we were anyway we we're driving along and I crashed into this car and I had just come to Christ like weeks before this. And normally, I, I just an expletive would have come out. Just, beep, would have been my normal operandi. But it didn't. And it didn't come out. And I was almost shocked. I almost had an expletive because I didn't have an expletive. I was like, oh, I didn't swear. Wow. I just crashed my car. But wow. I realized that God had changed because it's in those moments where you tested. You suddenly realize, man, God's been doing a work in my life. I'm different. I'm not swearing anymore. Now, overcoming the evil one, gaining victory over flesh and the world. And finally, fathers, it says that they have known him who was from the beginning. I believe this place of maturity is mature believers. They, they see the larger story, the big story in God, the, the larger picture, the sovereignty of God over history. And they're not shaken by this little event or that happening or this thing happening on the news. They know God is in control. He has a plan. And they're rooted in it. And they're living their life out of the reality of who God says He is and what He is going to do. And they understand the, the bigger picture of God. And that even though sometimes things happen in our world that we can't explain, it doesn't rattle them. They know, hey, God's got it under control. He's working out a plan. He's working all things together for good. It's going to work out. It's going to be okay. That's why I love mature believers. 
Because you get alongside, they go, oh, it's going to be all right. Yeah. Oh, thank the Lord. You know, I thought it was going to crash and burn, but Gay said it's going to be okay. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> we get encouraged and we go on. And then one day we become the people who understand the greater purposes of God, the deep truths of God, and we become solid for other people. Amen? Amen. Children, young adults, fathers, they have a biblical worldview, living from that biblical worldview. I want to finish by giving you four quick common blockages to growth, and then I want to give you four very quick habits to help us to grow. Blockages. Anyone say blockages? Blockages. See, sometimes we can be stunted, but there's reasons why we're stunted. There's reasons why we're not growing and expanding. And the first one is simply this sinful habits. Habits in our life which we know aren't good for us, but we just kind of keep doing them. We just keep going back to these things, this way of behaving, this attitude in our life, this pattern of behavior that just sort of keeps us down. And you know what? Sin messes everything up. Absolutely, it's messed God's good world up. And most of all, it, it messes with our spiritual life. See, the Bible says that our sin comes between us and God. So just like the sun is always there and always shining, uh, the clouds can sometimes come over. It kind of cleared a little bit today. But the clouds can come over. How many of you know the sun is still there, shining bright and beautiful, but we just can't feel it anymore? And that's what sin does. God is still loving us. God still has a plan and a purpose for us. But sin allows clouds to come over and separates us. And God is going, I love you. You're my daughter. You're my son. I want you close. And he wants so much for you to know him, so much he'd send his son to die for us. He's so desperate for us, but these clouds come over us and we just go, mm, I don't know if God's real anymore. I don't know if I believe. I don't know. Maybe I just made it all up. I'm just going to go live this way now. And we kind of fall back into the world. That's why sinful habits can be so dangerous. That's why when you come back to God, say, God, forgive me. <laughs> Clear those clouds in an instant. Jesus forgives us, restores us, and that fellowship comes back. We're like, thank you, Lord. You saved me from going down that wrong path. Sinful habits are like cholesterol in the arteries. It chokes the life out of us. Another bad uh, blockage can happen is apathy. You ever say apathy? Okay. It's just being lazy. Spiritual growth is like walking upstream. It takes a little bit of effort. And if you stop for too long, next thing you know, you're being carried down with the current. Spirit, growing spiritually takes some effort to put one foot in front of another, to get into the Word of God, to do the right thing, even when you don't feel it. But apathy uh, can rob us of our growth. Another one is negative people. Negative people in our world. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Paul says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So when we're around negative people who are kind of getting at us, that are pulling us down, pulling us away from the things of God, man, it can affect us. And sometimes we need to distance ourselves from those people or try and at least put healthy boundaries so that we're spending time around people who will encourage us in our faith. Someone say, Amen. 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 And there's many more, but the last one today is it's simply this one. I want to speak to this one, misunderstanding of grace. Oh, God's forgiven me. I'm saved by grace. Nothing that I could do. Jesus did it all on the cross. I've got my ticket to heaven. I'm all good. I can live however I like. And it's a dangerous thing because the amazing thing is God does give us incredible freedom. Like I said, he's not a God of rules. He's a God of relationship and freedom. But the problem is, is that if there is a real work of grace in your life from the Lord, that free gift from God, that is evidenced with change in your life. There should be growth, the Bible says. There should be evidence that, that you've received this grace. If you're going, oh, I'm forgiven. I can live however I like. I question whether that grace was from the Lord. Or maybe you've just taken a lie from the world and said, well, I can just live however I like. That is not going to help you grow in God. Amen? Amen. Misunderstanding grace can be dangerous. Uh, we're saved by His grace, absolutely. But the evidence of that grace is the growing life of God within us. We change. Suddenly we have a car accident and we don't swear. And it's an amazing thing to us. And I want to finish this morning simply with four, I've called these, Four habits of highly successful believers. 
I got all Stephen Covey on myself at the end of, end of this week and thought, yeah, I'm going to go for it. And it's a little simple acronym. So I wanted to just put something practical in your hands. It's about, remember, where there's, where there's life, there's growth, and life comes through connection with God and with other believers. But these are simple habits that help us to build those connections so that we can grow. And I want you to look at these. And I want you to ask yourself, how am I going in these? Number one habit is God times. Times with Him where you just, it's just you and Him. Not just on the way to work in the car, but where you shut the door and you get with your Bible and you go, okay, God, I'm here to spend time with you. Not just to bring my prayer list, but to get to know you, to learn about you, to worship you, to encounter you. And that can feel a little awkward and strange at first. We talked earlier about having a relationship with a God you can't see. But learning to do that, and sometimes learning, is just by putting yourself in that position for long enough till you figure it out and you begin to grow. God times, daily times with Him. Uh, R is read the Word, reading the Word of God, getting your nose in this book. Even the parts you don't understand, it still has an effect. It still washes you on the inside. Amen? Just like a leaky bucket, you might be like me. You read it, and it goes in one ear and straight out the other. You forget it it's the moment you walk away. But what I do know, just like a leaky bucket, you pour water into it, at least it cleans the bucket on the way through. Amen? Yeah. And reread the Word of God. It might go in one ear and out the other, but hey, at least it's cleaned us on the way through. Just get in the Word. But then try to understand. Get out some concordances. Look up some commentaries. Can I put out that I recommend the Olive Tree app? Olive Tree Bible app is brilliant. Plethora of commentaries, Bible translations, all kinds of stuff. If you want to go a bit deeper, get into some really cool nitty-gritty stuff. Man, you'll grow in your faith through uh, studying the Word through Olive Tree, Olive Tree Bible app. Bible app. And there's a whole bunch of gateways, there's all kinds of things out there. Regular t- God time. Second habit, read the Word every day. Another one, O is other believers. This is being planted in the house of God. This is joining a connect group during the week, being around other believers, going out uh, for coffee with someone that you can pray with and talk about the things of God with and talk about life and 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 because it's all about finding the right truth relevant to your situation now and that happens when we fellowship with other believers so other believers make it a habit and W is worship on Sundays coming together collectively like this there is power where the body of Christ meets together and you'll be encouraged just being in the Word of God, being in a place of worship. Even if you're feeling far away from God, it's the best place to be just to kind of begin to put yourself in close proximity to the things of God, being in church on Sunday mornings. But we've got to stop just coming to church and be the church. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Why don't you just... Go ahead and close your eyes just where you are. I'm just going to pray. I'll ask you a couple of questions. And just as your eyes are closed, how are you going with your spiritual walk? How are you growing? Are you growing? Or have you been stunted in some area? I didn't mention, but sometimes disappointment or discouragement can be a huge blockage. And maybe you need to face that and deal with it, with God. Just bring it to Him. Because life's too short to live discouraged. Life's too short to live uh, with questions. Uh, so many believers, they say, oh, I ain't going to church until I understand why this happened. Oh, I'm not going to follow God until, until I understand why that happened in my life. And I'll tell you what, you could be waiting a long time. And you might get to heaven, you might get all the answers you, you want on the other side of this life, in the next life. But you know what, you'll also have incredible regret that you let those questions hold you back from living the full life that God had planned for you. Let it go. Maybe you need to repent of some of those simple habits or apathy. God put a fire on the inside of us to grow. Lord, that we grow as individuals, we grow as a church. So here's a question for you. How's your connection with God? How's your connection with Him? This is where it all comes from. He's the vine, we're the branches. He's the supplier of life, forgiveness, hope, strength. He brings it all. We just have to be connected. And maybe you're here this morning, you've never made that connection. I want to give you the opportunity this morning to make that connection. And I'm so glad I did. When I was 15 years old, when I came alive to God, and He came into my world. Maybe that connection is very tentative. 
maybe a bit intermittent, missing a little bit. And you want it to be bigger. You want to make that, you want to establish that connection strong again. I want to give you the opportunity this morning to do that as well if you're in that place. In fact, right now, if you're in that place where you haven't made a connection and you want to this morning, or that connection is very light and tentative and you want to make it sure, I just want to lead us all in a simple prayer of just asking God to come into our lives, forgiving us and drawing us close this morning. Just so we don't embarrass any individual, we just want to ask, we all pray this. But don't pray it to me, pray it to God. He's the one who hears you and does a work of grace in your heart. So let's all pray together. Let's pray, Lord Jesus. Some of you didn't pray. Let's pray, oh, Lord Jesus. I just come to you right now. Open and honest. I thank you for dying for me. For dying for my sins. So that I could be forgiven. Will you forgive me right now? For everything I've ever done wrong. Wash my heart clean. Because I want to know you. Will you come into my life? I open my heart to receive you. And I put my trust in you. Lord, I want to be connected. I want to feel your presence. And I want you to work in my life. And I give you my life. Help me to walk with you and grow from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, right now, I just pray you just touch us. Just feel Holy Spirit just moving right now. Just keep your eyes closed. Lord, for those who haven't had a connection or that connection has felt non-existent. God, I pray right now that you just breathe life. Life right now. Lord, to begin to come in. Lord, like the branch being reconnected to the trunk. Let that life-giving sand, that life of God begin to flood in again. Bringing strength. Bringing hunger for the things of God. You know, becoming a Christian is not about getting all your questions answered. That's important. But that's not what becoming a Christian is. It's about starting a relationship with God. Having and maintaining that connection with Him. My last question to the rest of us this morning is, what's your next step to grow? To grow your connection with God, to grow your connection with other believers. What's your next step? What is God asking of you? to grow. Maybe it's to step out and serve Him in some area. Man, we grow a lot through doing that, to giving it a go. But Lord, I pray that you speak to us and you challenge each one of us and show us Lord, what we need to do, where we need to put ourselves. Maybe it's to start some of these habits of having God times and reading the Word and being with other believers and encouraging them and being encouraged by them and being in church on Sundays more regularly, Lord, and getting the kids there so they're also able to grow in the things of God. God forbid, Lord, that we raise a generation, Lord, that's being raised in our nation now that's godless, Lord, that doesn't know you, God, that has no hope or purpose. I told them they're just an accident, Lord, that just evolved out of nothing ultimately they're going to die and become nothing. Lord, what a hopeless message. What a stupid thing we tell our, our kids. God, may the kids be in the house of God where they can grow into the beautiful people that you made them to be because you loved them into existence. Because you, God, designed them for a purpose. Fearfully, wonderfully made. God, may we grow in you in every way. just look this way this morning I have a bunch of these and if you're a couple you might if you want one you might just need to take one per couple but I just thought I want to put something in your hands to give you a little bit of a kickstart 
and this growing thing. So I know you could walk out of church and again, what a lovely message and go have your coffee and forget all about it. But I want to give you, this is a simple, this is a simple Bible study by a man named Mike Bickle who started IHOP on transform, being transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's talking about Romans 12. And this is a great, simple Bible study, but it's really insightful. And if you want one of these, I want you to take one. In fact, I'll just split them and take one and pass them on. Take one and pass them on. Maybe one per couple. And if you want one, if you don't want one, just leave it. Don't take it. And if you're not going to read it, don't take it. If you're going to turn it into a dart, don't take it. <laughs> Only if you're going to read it and go through it and read the scriptures as you go through it. It's going to help you to grow. And that's what we're here for, to help you to grow.